Hi there everyone, my name is Danielle, and today I want to tell you about how I fell in love with the tactical RPG Fire Emblem Three Houses. I played this game for the first time last year, in 2021, and never expected to like it, let alone love it. And I've been wanting to talk about it for a really long time. This video is going to talk about my journey with Fire Emblem Three Houses, how I went from being skeptical about the game's pedigree to falling head over heels in love with it. It ended up being my most played game on the Switch in 2021, and I take great pride in that. Now, there isn't going to be any sort of analysis of the game, nor will I be getting into the fine details because I want to avoid spoilers. I plan to eventually put out something talking about this game in depth, but for now, this is just me talking about my personal experience with the game in hopes that you may check it out as well. Anything I say is purely to help you understand my mindset at the time I am referring to, and is not a critique. My goal is to paint a full picture of my journey with this game, and gush about why I love it. It is really freaking good, in case you were wondering. To make things easier, I will be referring to the game as Three Houses for the rest of the video. Greetings, Professor! Nothing to report! So, Three Houses came out for the Switch in July 2019, and... I didn't really care about it. I'd never even heard of Fire Emblem before this game. If you're familiar with my content, then you may know that I have spent most of my life as a casual gamer. I played platformers and party games growing up, and very rarely stepped out of that bubble. Since my family and friends weren't big into games, there were a lot I just didn't hear about. I wasn't familiar with the gaming space and discourse. I didn't grow up with Nintendo Power. I didn't devour strategy guides in the car on the way home from GameStop when I bought a game. I just liked playing as a bear with a bird in his backpack and making up stories as I went, or beating my brother in Diddy Kong Racing. I want to stress this point because I think some folks may think I lived under a rock to have never heard of Fire Emblem, but let me tell you, I also never heard of Persona and didn't know the big spoiler for Final Fantasy VII until I was in my late 20s. Games as a medium meant very little to me. So, if it didn't pertain to my five franchises I had dipped my toes into, I didn't know about it. Over the last five years, my interest in games has increased tremendously, to the point that I like to refer to myself as a hashtag gamer. I label myself in this way because I've developed much more of an interest in the medium itself and the unique stories that can be told within it and I've gone from playing only platformers to a ton of different genres. Games that I would otherwise look past are now new adventures I am eager to try. Which leads me to Three Houses. I was apathetic toward it upon release. People were hyped, and I wasn't. I was preoccupied with the franchises I cared about, and what I was currently playing. After all, I'd never heard of Fire Emblem, so it meant little to me. At the insistence of many friends, I finally gave the game my eyes, but the strategy elements left me feeling a tad anxious. I had never played a game like this before, so it felt out of my wheelhouse. I naturally gravitate toward games with real-time action combat. This isn't to say that these are the only sorts of games I play, but it is where I feel most at home. Three Houses was far outside of my comfort zone, since half of its playtime is turn-based strategy a genre at which I had never played and did not think I excelled. The game has multiple campaigns, and I was told that one could take 100 hours alone. This meant it'd be a big time investment, and I wanted to be sure it was something I'd enjoy. And there is the added layer of the price. Since it is a Nintendo game, Three Houses normally sells for the full price of $60. From my standpoint, it was something that was going to cost me a lot of dollars and hours, and this is why I wanted to feel confident about my purchase. In an effort to aid my decision, I sought out Let's Plays on YouTube in hopes that I would get a better idea of how the game handled. I'd done this in the past with games that didn't initially tickle my fancy, with mixed results. Sometimes a game just has to be played to get the feel of it, and that ended up being the case with Three Houses. I watched a bit of a Let's Play that left me intrigued, but didn't sway me in either direction. I then watched part of the Awesome Games Done Quick 2020 speedrun of the game, which confused me even more than anything else. Like, why is this person upside down? Who is Ferdinand von Eyer? What is happening? You may be wondering why I didn't just download a demo, and, well, I don't have a good answer to that question. 
I very rarely download demos, so I guess the idea never occurred to me. Since watching Let's Plays and speedruns had been helpful to me in the past, it made sense that the same could happen with Three Houses, but that wasn't the case. Another game that was on my radar around this time was Octopath Traveler, a game that interested me far more than Three Houses, which is weird in hindsight for a plethora of reasons which I will get to later. But anyway, Octopath is an example of another game that is turn-based and has a great story that people had been recommending non-stop. What had gotten me so pumped about the game was the music. A YouTuber named VGO Score put out a 20-minute symphonic suite of the game's music, which I randomly listened to one day at work, and let me tell you, this music took me on a journey. Like, I was almost in tears at my desk because I was so moved by this music. I made up my mind to add the game to my wishlist and hoped to buy it on an eventual sale. Now, you may be wondering why I am even bringing up Octopath Traveler when this is a video about three houses. My interest in both games sort of happened around the same time, and I started to view them as a set. They were both games that featured gameplay that wasn't my style, but were both story-heavy, and were recommended to me constantly. Not just by my friends, but all of the interwebs. So I added them both to my wishlist, and bought Octopath Traveler first, thinking it would be the game that I would enjoy far more. I guess I should have known better than to think that Octopath Traveler would be a game I would adore, because the game contains my most dreaded nemesis, random encounters. My god, the random encounters. I, I knew they were in the game, but somehow told myself like someone who returns to a failed relationship, this time I'll make it work. Nope, I, I still hate them. I hate them. I'm not saying Octopath is a bad game or criticizing it in any way, but I slowly gave up on it and have yet to pick it up again. The story I experienced so far was engaging and left me wanting more, but the gameplay was hard to stomach. I plan to return to it at some point because I still crave to experience the story. And who knows, perhaps I will be making another video in a few years talking about how I fell in love with Octopath Traveler. Shortly after giving up on Octopath, I bought three houses and hoped I would have a better experience with that game than the former. I am Ferdinand von Eyre. I played Elden Ring with a friend of mine at the start of 2022, and a funny thing would continuously happen. When we were in my world and he was helping me explore and eventually take on a boss, I would pick up an item and then proceed to click X without looking at what the item was. My friend would then ask what I picked up and I would sit in silence, realizing I hadn't paid any attention at all. This happened so often that it became a running joke between the two of us. Earlier in this video, I mentioned that I grew up primarily playing platformers. Banjo-Kazooie was a game I sunk hours into and didn't beat until I was well into adulthood. When I wasn't playing that game, you might have found me playing Diddy Kong Racing, or Super Mario Bros, or Donkey Kong Country, or even Tony Hawk's Underground. It was these games that shaped how I internally understood games. As far as I knew, there were no complexities beyond what was on the screen in front of me. All I had to do was learn the controls and get good at jumping from one platform to another and pressing the buttons in the right order. I didn't have to read anything extra or do any work within the menus, it was all just there in front of me. I bring this up because this is an example of how the games of my youth influenced how I play games now. They didn't require the same part of my attention. If I zoned out and spent too much time in my own head while playing Banjo-Kazooie, it was okay, because the punishment wasn't that severe. If I forgot a move, I could simply go to a molehill for a refresher. But as I started diversifying the games I played that had more complex systems, I found many of them to be punishing when it comes to drifting attention. If I didn't immerse myself in a game, I would miss important instructions or story bits. I am conscious of this part of me that is ingrained to play games as I played them as a kid. It isn't a good or bad thing. After all, games have various genres and present various levels of complexity when it comes to their gameplay and systems. Banjo-Kazooie is not a lesser game because of its simplicity, nor is Elden Ring better because of its complexities. They're just different games. And games always contain some sort of learning curve. Additionally, every person plays games differently, and that's okay though some games may require more of our absorption than others. As I've grown to love video games more and more, I have become much more conscious of where I direct my attention when playing them. I'm aware that my attention drifts, and I try to be as present in the game as possible 
and learn the game and digest it. Something that was once unnatural to me because the games I played never asked it of me. While I am much better at doing this now, there's a large part of me that still slips into that old behavior. And again, I want to stress that this is not a good or bad thing, just an observation of how I play games. I bring all of this up because when I went to play Three Houses, I felt I had to mentally prepare myself. It felt like I was stepping into the unknown and I wasn't sure if I'd be able to find my way through. I knew this would be a game that would present complexities in which I had not yet experienced in a game. Sure, I'd seen a good chunk of a Persona 5 playthrough, a game that also boasts a lengthy timestamp and fits in the role-playing genre, but I still hadn't played the game myself. In this way, Three Houses was completely alien to me. Now you may be thinking, wow, she put way too much thought into this. And yeah, I did. But games take time and energy two things that can feel like a rare commodity. And I didn't want to put that into something I wasn't enjoying or understanding. Plus, this was a bit of a project anyway, because at the time I was working on a magazine project, also under the name Level Story. Each issue focused on a single game and its story. So I was constantly paying attention to the story in the games I played, in case it could be a contender for a future issue. Thank you, my teacher. So the time finally came for me to pop in the Three Houses cartridge. I chose to play on normal difficulty, the easiest of the three difficulty levels, and the recommended difficulty level for first time Fire Emblem players. Then there are two modes you can choose from, casual or classic. I selected casual because I seriously don't understand why anyone would play on Classic. I just don't get it. If a unit dies, they're dead forever. Why would you want to do that? What are you telling me you don't save scum? Don't lie, just play in casual mode, you coward. I also chose to play as female Byleth because they are the true Byleth and I won't hear a word otherwise. Upon getting into the game proper, my overall feelings toward it were largely positive. The opening cutscene is amazing from the animation to the voice acting and to the intrigue of it all. I'm not being hyperbolic when I say that it is among my favorites in any game. It left me feeling incredibly excited to see what was going on and where the story was taking me. The game then begins with some basic exposition, followed by a tutorial battle. You then make your way to Garrig Mach Monastery, the headquarters of the Church of Saros and the site of the Officer's Academy where Byleth will be teaching. Once you arrive, you learn more about the monastery, the war children you will be teaching, and you must choose your house the blue lions, black eagles, or golden deer. Any big choice like this always gives me anxiety because it is a choice that locks you in for the rest of the game. If I was going to put 95 hours into this game, I wanted to make sure it was for a house I really liked. After talking to all of the characters, I didn't feel all too compelled toward one house or the other. A lot of my decision making was based on the head of house. I was fairly certain I didn't want to go with the blue lions, mostly because I didn't like Dimitri at first glance. His character radiated with nice guy energy, and he looked like any main protagonist of a video game. My choice was between the Black Eagles and the Golden Deer. Although I was interested in going with the female-led house, the Black Eagles, I also wasn't very taken by Edelgard on first pass. She didn't seem uninteresting, but nothing about her made me feel confident that this was the house I would want to stick with for the game. Oh, what a sweet summer child I was. Then there was the Golden Deer, led by Claude. This was the house I had heard the most about, mostly from the GDQ speedrun I mentioned earlier, which ran the Golden Deer route. I'd heard it was a very chill house, and as a self-proclaimed Hufflepuff, I was fully on board with this. It was a really difficult decision. As much as I wanted to go with the female-led house and get to know Edelgard's character better, I ended up choosing Claude and the chill Golden Deer. Although the starting moments of Three Houses gripped me, I didn't end up playing it that often. In fact, I was so on and off with the game that gameplay concepts and plot points often escaped me. So despite my best efforts to learn a Fire Emblem game, I ended up playing with a constant sense of confusion. I was playing a lot of other games at the time that were demanding my attention, so three houses fell on the back burner. Since I was working from home, my usual time of play was in 15 minute intervals when I would take a break. It wasn't a good way for a newbie to play this game, but alas, it is how I was playing it. I went from playing like this for a good while, certain game concepts clicking with me faster than others. And even though I wasn't playing as I had expected, I was still enjoying myself. There was something I found to be very endearing about the game, 
even though it wasn't the primary game absorbing my full attention. I'm not sure when I started playing on a more consistent basis, but I began playing the game every day, albeit months after originally starting. Eventually I got to the midpoint and... Holy shit, y'all. The midpoint. Like I said, this video is spoiler free, so I don't want to talk about specifics. What I can say is that the midpoint drastically changed my perspective of this game, and was a true turning point, not only in the story, but in my own relationship to the game. This is when I really started obsessing over Three Houses, not only playing it on work breaks, but all evening once I clocked out. I was utterly engrossed in the story. Because my memory is so hazy around specifics at this time, it feels like my life is split into two sections, before loving Three Houses and after loving Three Houses. Like, there was a time I had no interest in this game? Who was that person? I hardly know her. Oh, come on, let me gush! There is so much to love about this game that I could probably go on for hours, but we don't have that kind of time, and this is spoiler free, so let's jump into it. The Fire Emblem games are held in high regard when it comes to their stories, and Three Houses is no exception. This is a story full of mystery, about religious institutions and corruption. It is a story about war and ideals, a story about perspective, a story about the trauma the characters experience and how they respond to it. Trauma. Yet within the heavy themes are moments of levity. The game is littered with genuine wholesomeness and humor. If there is one thing I love for my video games, it is stories that force characters to deal with trauma while being extremely wholesome and silly. 10 out of 10. This game contains some of my favorite story moments of all time. Scenes that build tension so well and make me feel like my heart is about to leap out of my chest. It's very effective, and oftentimes, scenes would remain in my head for literal days after I experienced them. Even now, I will think about them and get chills when I remember playing for the first time. This game receives a lot of praise for its storytelling, and, well, it's deserved. It is a masterclass. Equally compelling are the characters in this game. My god, the characters. I love them so much. Three Houses, as with past Fire Emblem games, incorporates the support system into its gameplay. These are unlocked whenever you have increased your bond with another character, or two characters have increased their bond with each other. Once this threshold has been met, players can view what's called a support cutscene between the two characters. These scenes help flesh out the cast of characters, giving us more of their backstory and their philosophies on many different topics. Supports can range from revealing a character's deep-seated trauma, you know, generational trauma, to incredibly silly shenanigans, and they're just wonderful. Every character has such a distinct personality, and learning more about them is just my favorite thing. What I loved so dearly was how my initial reaction to them was almost always wrong. There was always more beneath the surface. Since I had never played a Fire Emblem game before, I had no idea that this system existed, and it took me way too long to actually realize it was a mechanic that I could initiate in the main menu. Supports not only improve your relationship with a character, but have a mechanical purpose. There are benefits in battle to having a stronger support ranking with another character. Thematically, growing closer to the characters in your house is important, but it also matters when in battle. Your relationships make you stronger. There are a number of ways to increase your bond with characters or increase the bond between them. You can eat a meal with them, or pray with them, or have them take lessons together, or take them to the spa. That isn't weird at all. You can even take them to tea. The most amazing and awkward mechanic in a video game. And what would tea time be without the amazing dialogue in this game? What makes the supports and the cutscenes and interactions so great is the expert dialogue. Good dialogue should serve a purpose, whether that purpose is to give us insight into a character or flesh out the world and the story. Three Houses comes alive with its dialogue. Every sentence, be it serious or silly, conveys an attention to detail that makes the characters and story bloom. To top it off, everything is voice acted. The voice actors are incredible and do an amazing job at portraying characters who we empathize with and care about deeply. I just loved everyone's delivery. A standout for me was Sheremy Lay, who plays Lady Rhea. Unfortunately, I can't play my favorite voice line here because it is a pretty big spoiler, but I found her portrayal of Rhea to be perfect. Rhea's dialogue could easily be read at face value, but 
play does such a good job at capturing the nuances of each line. It's just so freaking good. The three house leader voice actors also did an amazing job as well. And again, everyone did a fantastic job. I can't think of a bad performance. Paired with the excellent writing, Three Houses dialogue is a real treat to experience. Another treat is this game's world building. Three Houses paints such a vivid portrait of Fodlin and those who inhabit it. The politics and the history that are depicted in every crevice of this game's runtime is astounding. Playing this game truly immerses you in this world and makes it feel lived in. From little bits of dialogue that shed light on past events, to library books you can pick up and read in your free time, it doesn't feel contrived, but it is inspired and complex in its portrayal. It is really top-notch. Speaking of top-notch, the art style of this game is a delight. It switches between two different styles to be more specific. Its primary style during gameplay and most cutscenes and its major cutscene style, which is a more traditional hand-drawn style. I found the art style to be highly enjoyable. It isn't anything earth-shattering, but it manages to look unique and interesting. Playing through this game was just wonderful to look at, and the face portraits are great. The major cutscenes are beautifully animated. I honestly wish there were more of them. It would have been great to have gotten some DLC or something. Now I have to talk about the gameplay. As hesitant as I was going into this game, I ended up loving it in and out of combat. Running around the monastery and getting new dialogue with the characters and doing different activities was always very rewarding. It never felt stagnant, but like an actual living, breathing place. Whenever I explored, a weird nostalgia crept over me that reminded me of my own school days and staying away at summer camp. One of my favorite activities had to be the fishing. Three Houses made fishing so enjoyable in a way that most games just fail to do. It was short and sweet, with easy to learn mechanics and great replayability. Every time I caught a fish, I got a little hit of dopamine and had to catch just one more. But of course the big question is, did I enjoy the combat? Well, it turns out the thing I feared the most going into this was something I came to love just as much as the other elements in this game. Three Houses does an excellent job at teaching the player about the combat mechanics, and I really excelled at it once I got my feet wet. My initial fears that it would be too difficult or too confusing came from a place of unfamiliarity with the genre. Once I got playing, I found I was pretty good at strategizing. Making battle preparations and making sure each unit was best placed on the map was such a fun challenge. Learning the map terrain and what advantages and disadvantages it had was also really enjoyable. Every character gets their own animations and dialogue, which I somehow never tired of. I don't know, I just can't get sick of Ignatz yelling, let me paint you a picture, when he is about to crit someone. It is just very good. And I love the little hearts that pop up when you grow your bond with another unit on the battlefield. Now, I won't say I wanted to battle non-stop, and this is where the game struck a nice balance for me. The game is pretty structured, so I got used to having multiple days of free time to spend doing activities and growing bonds with the students and faculty, while also looking forward to battle at the end of the month. And if I wanted to do more battles, the game had plenty of optional content that gave me the option to do so, while also getting bonus story on top of it. I've heard veterans say the combat is not a challenge on normal difficulty. While this may be true, as a newbie, I found the difficulty to be just right. It was challenging enough that I felt proud of myself during battle, but easy enough that I didn't grow frustrated. If it had been harder, I might have soured toward the game. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that the combat that I feared would either bore me or become too difficult wasn't boring or too difficult at all, just different than what I was used to. And different is good because it introduces you to new things, but it can still be scary. Either way, I'm really glad I took the plunge despite my fears. And then there is the music. I'm a huge music nerd. Like, I still own an iPod music nerd. When it comes to video games, I vary when it comes to my initial reaction to their score. Sometimes it immediately hits me, while other times I get annoyed with the soundtrack and need some time away from it to truly appreciate it. Three Houses was in the middle of that. It didn't win me over right away, but it also didn't annoy me after hearing it for hours and hours. I genuinely liked the songs in this game and came to love them over time. What I appreciate about this game's soundtrack is the little nuances. It manages to weave the main theme throughout multiple tracks, and yet never feels repetitive but fresh. It is so tonally consistent and perfectly complements the environment where it plays. When you walk around the monastery, the music vibrates with the energy that would exist within a learning religious environment. 
It is all just so good. Here are some of my favorite tracks in no particular order. Life at Garrig Mach Monastery sets a perfect tone for the environment. I just love how jovial it sounds and how much it captures the atmosphere. Somewhere to belong and a place to rest are very soft tracks played during emotional moments. I grew really attached to these. They have such a peaceful vibe. Apex of the World is probably my favorite song from the game. It is the battle theme from the end of the Crimson Flower route, and it's just so, so, so good. It goes so hard and brings back a bunch of musical themes that resonate thematically with what is happening on screen. It is just amazing. God Shattering Star is the battle theme for the end of the Verdant Wind route, and this is a track that completely surprised me by how unique it sounds. I've honestly never heard a track like it. It is so good. A Funeral of Flowers is fantastic as well. I believe this is the battle theme for the end of the Silver Snow route. Like Apex of the World, this reuses themes from the game to match what is going on on screen, but it is a bit softer, which makes for a very beautiful track. And of course, I can't go without mentioning the main theme. The main theme is very good, and interwoven in various tracks throughout the game, which I love. And finally, as an added bonus, I have to talk about my favorite character, Edelgard. I really love Edelgard, and to talk about why would require heavy spoilers for the entire game, so I guess I will continue to paint in broad strokes. I find her to be one of the most nuanced and well-written characters that I've encountered in any game, even if her story gets the shaft for much of the later half of her route. Her confidence and how she presents herself is super fascinating and exemplifies the excellent character work in this game. And getting to know her better and see another side of her is just the best. Bonding with her and romancing her as female Byleth brought me so much joy. I'm not sure I can put it into words. And out of all the roots, hers feels to be the true one. Don't get me wrong, the others are valuable and I still love them, but Edelgard's is the one that leans the hardest into the themes the game is setting up. I could go on and on about this character and why I love her, but I will save that for a future video when I can talk spoilers. Me, 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 me. <coughs> Something appears to be wrong with my throat. I want to tell you a short story before wrapping up this video. As previously mentioned, I became obsessed with this game. I played it as often as possible and would then think about it nonstop. One day, I brought my Switch to work with me, uh, just to show the game to some of my coworkers. They'd heard me talk about it nonstop, so this was nothing out of the ordinary. I showed them the various students around the monastery and the different locations and explained what activities I could do. And one of my coworkers said, I can tell this game makes you very happy. I've never seen you look so happy, which is very funny and also true. This game makes me very happy. So yeah, that is how I fell in love with Fire Emblem Three Houses and why I love it so much. I know I will play this game many, many times in the future, and I wanted to share my experience with you because I want to encourage everyone to play this game too. If you've never played a Fire Emblem game like myself, then the learning curve can feel overwhelming at first, but you will get it eventually and do just fine. The game does have its problems, but the positives far outweigh the negatives, and this is by far one of my favorite games of all time. Thank you for watching this video. If you liked it, please like the video and subscribe. I want to give a big shout out to fedatamine.com for being a huge resource in creating this video. They are a three houses data mining project and helped me out tremendously. Link to their site is in the video description. I also want to shout out my friends Brittany and Sam for reading through this script and helping me make it stronger. This video is a lot better because of their help. I had originally planned on getting this video out when Fire Emblem Warriors Three Hopes released at the end of June, since Fire Emblem was relevant again. But as you can see, that didn't happen. But hey, better late than never. I just started playing Three Hopes and am so happy to have reunited with my war children and get more Edelgard. It is wonderful. And I'm enjoying the Muso gameplay much more than I anticipated, so that is a win. More content is on the way, hopefully a Three Houses analysis video in the future. And hey, if you like Three Houses, tell me why in the comments. I would love to gush about this game and tell everyone about my love of Edelgard some more.